My name is Max Orr. Welcome to Carolina Public Humanities and the General Alumni Association's presentation of Lunch with Friends and Strangers, our biography series where we get to meet with uh, wonderful friends on the faculty and learn about some people that we maybe have heard of but maybe don't know as well, so we call them strangers, but we hope they're friends by the end of today. Uh, we are delighted to be joined by Dr. Tatiana String today. Hello, Tatiana. We call Tatiana Tanya, so for the rest of this, don't be confused. Uh, Tanya, how are you? I'm very well, Max, and I'm glad to be here and glad to be seeing everyone today. Indeed, indeed. Like uh, from the comfort of our own homes, who knows how long this will last, but it's wonderful that we have this uh, uh, technology uh, to work. Well, let's get right to it. Um, we, have, uh, we have a wonderful uh, person to look at, someone that I think people um, have heard of, right? Uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense, but really have notes because there are more illustrious versions of who and what she was. Let's take a look at this person. Who are we talking about today? We're looking at Anne of Cleves, or Anna of Cleve, as she might have said in her native German tongue. And she is, of course, best known as one of Henry VIII's six wives. Not a great position to get. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's so closely kind of allied her with the group that she mm -hmm. somehow gets kind of lost in the mix. And I think that there are enough interesting, maybe less well-known kind of observations that we could make about Anne that might help to kind of stamp her a little bit more firmly in people's imaginations. Be before we get right into Anne, let's talk a little bit about the whole sort of mythos of Henry VIII's wives and and how this, you know, um, you know, certainly people know the songs, they can uh, make the jokes, um, but what does it do to a sort of a category? Here are six women, all very different from each other, all with their own stories. Um, how has it really affected us as historians or even just the popular culture, having them grouped together like this? Well, I think in a lot of ways, it amplifies the whole notion of Henry's kind of masculinity and the fact that he could go through six women in a lifetime when most kind of royal men or aristocratic men of, at this time would go through three, maybe four wives, but six does seem to be a kind of impressive number of wives and women to kind of marry and then dispense with one way or another. And, and I certainly, think, yeah. Certainly. Uh, you know, the Anne Boleyn getting rid of them in these ways also adds to the, you know, the story, if you will. Of course. And I think that what's fascinating to me is that, you know, uh, last year when I was the faculty director of UNC's London program, I started seeing signs in the underground about six. And it was a new musical called Six. And it took me a minute until the penny dropped to realize that there is now a kind of quite wonderful and you know bombastic musical performance by the six wives of Henry VIII, all oh, that's brought together as if they were kind of coexisting. And their afterlives are really making a big statement right now. It's really quite a, it's like they're, they formed a kind of girl group. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. We, we in the humanities know that when we touch on uh, humanic issue, humanistic issues from the past. When I, we are also talking about the present and thinking about how we can learn from this. And it sounds to me when I hear about the 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 six uh, musical um, that there is some lesson in here about the role of women and what and the relationship between women and men. And certainly with the Me Too movement being another uh, 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 something we've been paying attention to for the yeah. past ten years uh, or five years at least. Um, it's a very interesting, we can get some insights on the dynamics between the genders by looking way back in the past even. Well, I think that that's one of the things I'd want to start with to kind of explain who Anne was, that she's not just the one in the middle period of Henry's life, mm -hmm. but that in fact, you know, she is born into a very high noble family in Northwestern Germany. She is born in Dusseldorf, you know, kind of that vicinity, from mm -hmm. parents who both brought 
major land holdings together. She is very wealthy. Her, her father is the Duke of Cleves. She lives in a palace. Mm -hmm. This is not just a kind of normal female experience. Sure. And yet, at the same time, I think that there is a real sense in which she is just like so many other women of this period in mm -hmm. that she is trained up for kind of domestic life. She learns how to read and write, but only in German, which would have been kind of useful for conversing yeah. and maybe, you know. That's not the learned language. Exactly, exactly. She's only le learning how to read German. She learns embroidery and other needlework skills, and she stays apparently very close to her mother's arm is the way it's mm -hmm. described. So she is somewhat sheltered, which is again, very typical of the woman's life. It's an inside life. It's a kind of you know, life of the home rather than mm -hmm. the brother who would have gone out into the world, had been right. educated in the new learning. And Anne is very much restricted in her movements as so many other women would have been at this time. You know, I know your entryway into this and we should emphasize that um, you are an art historian and um, that the entryway into this is that, you know, we don't even really know who Anne of Cleves, Henry VIII doesn't even know who Anne of Cleves is, right? Uh, in a way, in a way, until, or the idea of Anne of Cleves, until we get to some of these, uh, some of these uh, images. And I'm going to pull up a couple of these now and talk about the art history entryway uh, into this. And you'll just, uh, excuse me here, by bringing up this, like I mentioned to you before, Tanya, this is where the wonderful world of Zoom is, where we have a, a quaint amateurism that sneaks into this as I as I am the producer and trying to pull up the pictures at the same time. But let me just pull this up because our art in, our art history entryway, of course, I'm going to show this is Henry uh, Henry the Eighth by Hans Holbein the Younger. Um, so talk a little bit about Holbein, and then we'll get how Anna Cleves fits into this picture uh, and how your entryway. I must say that that is actually how I became interested in both Anne and Henry VIII, who is my kind of specialist, special subject if I were in the, the mastermind black chair, mm -hmm. um, that this is one of several portraits of Hans Holbein's uh, relationship with Henry VIII. This is actually a kind of small scale portrait. Mm -hmm. It looks quite grand and he's bursting out of the, the frame of this picture but it gives you a real good sense of Henry's kind of mature self. Here he is in his 40s, mm -hmm. as we imagine Henry today. And Holbein is, of course, the artist of choice at this point. You can see that he is very detailed in his interest in fabric, in hair, mm -hmm. even in the wrinkles around Henry's eyes, which are beautifully crafted by Holbein. And this mm -hmm. is an artist that, you know, Henry continues to patronize. So Henry has, you know, asked Holbein to make the great Whitehall mural at this point, and he is celebrating his marriage with Anne of, uh, with sorry, with Jane Seymour in mm -hmm. 1537. Now, number story, number three. Three. Now the story really with Anne of Cleves kind of begins with that in that Jane Seymour, who I, I'm not showing you now, I think that would be just like an art history lecture, Jane Seymour dies in 1537 after finally giving birth to the long-awaited male heir. Edward. Edward is born in October of 1537, and Jane dies 12 days later. Yes, I mean, as a result of the childbirth. And so Henry is absolutely distraught. But maybe six months go by and he starts saying, okay, you're right. I probably wouldn't mind having another wife. Yeah, so here we've gotten to divorced, which was Catherine of Aragon, beheaded, which was Anne Boleyn, died, which is Jane Seymour. Mm -hmm. And so in 1538, in the spring, his ministers start suggesting names for a fourth queen. And it's at this point where Henry starts making inquiries about eligible young women on the continent. He would like to make an alliance with someone that would draw him in closely with either his, one of his great rivals, Francis I of France or Charles V, the so, Holy Roman Emperor. And it's interesting to just look at the, the trajectory of his other wives. His first wife would, you might call a dynastic marriage as well. 
course. And then, and then the defiance of his religious, you know, Anne Boleyn and, and picking yes. English consorts. So this is uh, going back to a dynastic relationship. This seems like a good idea. You got the male heir, so that's sort of taken care of. And it would be a wonderful opportunity. And certainly his ministers are looking at the kind of double advantages on the continent of making alliances either with Charles V or with Francis I. Mm -hmm. So if you bring up the next slide. Yeah, absolutely. Of Christina of Denmark. Yes. The first place that Henry goes is to a Habsburg candidate. And? and there she should be. They're coming up. There she is. There she is. There's a Habsburg candidate who would suit Henry down to the T. Mm -hmm. She is a 16-year-old widow, I will say. She's already widowed at this point, and you can see <sighs> her in her mourning dress. Yes, mm -hmm. women were pawns. They are commodities that are traded across the kind of great houses of Europe. And Christina was married at 13. Did we mention the Me Too movement at all times? Uh, <laughs> uh, we're talking about a very heavily patriarchal uh, mm -hmm. system that these girls are kind of, you know, just existing in. Yeah. And Christina is the first real viable candidate. And so she won't come to meet Henry. There's no swipe left or right. He can't see her. So what does he do? His very trusted court painter, Hans Holbein, is dispatched to Brussels, where Christina is living with Margaret of, or with Mary of Hungary. Mm -hmm. And they allow Holbein a three-hour sitting to take the portrait of this young beauty. And she is. That's she's well renowned as a beautiful young woman. So we assume he does a, a sketch and then fills it in in yes. his studio. And and what a remarkable because I'm just just as from an art history perspective, the personality that is just screaming off of uh, Christina's face in here is remarkable. Um, you do get a sense of verisimilitude that he might have caught something there. Yeah, she she even has a kind of what's been called a little bit of a sway or swing to her body, as if she's kind of just entered the room, and all of those kind of sweeping folds at the bottom suggest that she has kind of moved, that her body is capable of kind of moving underneath all of that rich fabric. And Honestly, the, Tanya, I see much more movement in this picture than I do in the Henry VIII that's yeah, bursting through exactly. the well, the Henry VIII is a kind of icon. That's yeah. really something that yeah, know, sure. communicates something different. This is, Henry wants as much information as he possibly can get about this girl. Now, Christina, who, as you, as you say, this is probably the result of a studio completion. Holbein would have sketched her and dealt with as many details as possible, showed it to Henry upon his return, and apparently, Henry fell instantly in love with this, and there was much singing and dancing at court, and hoping that this would, in fact, result in a marriage. Now, <laughs> the Habsburgs were kind of tolerating this for a while, but Christina apparently had no interest in this. Um, she said, if I, had but, if I had two heads, I might consider lending one to the King of England. Yeah, somebody's got a little bit of a yeah. reputation, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, she knows what has preceded her, so she... Can I ask one... One yep. question about that, just in terms of the mores of the time, uh, is Christina's uh, refusal tied to this, the fact that it's a second marriage? Does that give her more strength in that type of decision, or is it still just she's chattel for whoever she's farmed out to? She does get farmed out later. She does get another marriage to, to solidify a French uh, alliance between... But do we know it was her yeah. refusal? For it was her refusal for Henry VIII or the families? Or? I, think that, I think that her aunt, uh, her great aunt, uh, uh, Mary of Hungary, is the one who really says, you know, I just don't yeah. see this. No, let's not. So, what this does, though, is provoke a kind of further exploration of eligible young women. Mm -hmm. So, once again, he moves away from Habsburgs and thinks, okay, let's try French. Yeah, let's try the French court. And mm -hmm tries to actually ask Francis I to have a bunch of eligible princesses. 
brought to Calais so that he can actually see them in person. Mm. And Francis this the is, first, Francis the, says, says they're not horses for trading. I, this no. is like the Byzantine practice where the Byzantine emperors would have these shows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I should say that this is not uncommon for a portraitist to be sent. This had been done, Jan van Eyck was doing this in the 15th century. So this is not a, a, a new practice. Yeah. But what Holbein is again dispatched to do is to go and make portraits of the French princesses who Francis would not allow to be seen in person as mm -hmm. if they were horse trading. <laughs> but in fact, goes to various French courts, you know, uh, Lorraine and Guise and takes portraits of these women. None of those remain to us today. We I was going to say, they're not extant, no, so we just, no, we just, no. we know that there's a whole, well, I, I mean, I imagine as an art historian, just the amount of, there's more loss than there is uh, there's so remaining. Much loss. There's so much loss. And I think that, again, it would, it would be a wonderful thing to find out, but we can sort of imagine from Holbein's quite uniform style what these women might have looked like. Mm -hmm. But this falls apart too. And by kind of 1539, really, Anne's name becomes, rises to the top of the pool, our Anne of Cleves, rises to the top of the pool of candidates. And she's a very good, suitable match for two reasons. She is a representative of a family that is kind of not part of the, the Lutheran reform movement. Yeah, which is, of course, yeah, of she course. Have grown up in the Reformation. The wars know. of religion are, yeah, I mean, this is a, a, yeah. a terrible yeah. time in have, Germany, she especially. Grown up in all of this. She would have grown up, you know, with Luther's reforms. But her father was more of a kind of follower of Erasmus and sought a kind of humanist reform yeah. of the church. Of course, yeah. Erasmus, is praise of folly, has always looked at this wonderful book that could go in one direction, but he remains faithful to the Catholic exactly. Church. Exactly. So he, it, it doesn't go all the way. So they are of a kind of moderate, no longer Catholic, which, of course, Henry has broken from the Catholic yeah, Church sure. at this point. And our friend Thomas Cromwell, Henry's chief minister at this point, those mm -hmm. who were Wolf Hall uh, yeah, it's, trilogy. We haven't brought up Hilary Mantel yet. Uh, <laughs> no, we haven't actually. We haven't. But, you know, Thomas Cromwell, of course, seeks this alliance in particular. He Would you say this is a height of Cromwell's power at this point? This is the absolute height of Cromwell's power. And he's got about five minutes left. <laughs> he's got about five minutes left. Yeah. But this is the moment where he sees an opportunity to kind of expand alliance away from either Francis or Charles, which is the traditional way to go, and mm -hmm. move to Cleves, to, to think about an alliance with Cleves. It's good for the, for the Duke of Cleves, who is now Anne's brother. Yeah, the father has died, and now it's Duke William of Cleves. I, I, we assume that the Duke of Cleves is nominally allegiant to the Holy Roman Emperor. Mm, this is the point. He's actually quite resistant to yeah. the cause. He has land holdings that the emperor would love to have. Gelders is something that would have provided Charles V with a kind of pure flow from the continent over to the Netherlands, which is sure. Charles, and into the North Sea. And this would have given him the entire swathe of Northern Europe. So there's a strategic reason for oh. this alliance as well as just... Yeah. Yeah. influence and whatnot. And for Henry, you know, for Henry and Cromwell, this is an, another opportunity to kind of circumvent that land grab by Charles V. So in some ways, this really is on paper an excellent match. And mm -hmm. the whole idea of this seems to work very well. But he's got to have a picture. Yeah, well, and unfortunately, mm -hmm. the reports of Anne have not been you know, necessarily consistent. At first they were saying, you know, I've heard no real praise of her. And yet, as they start coming in closer to this being the candidate, there is this kind of, you know, panegyric of she outshines Jane Seymour as the kind of sun outshone, outshines the moon. You know, this yeah. kind of, you know, very heavy flattery. And so Henry's thinking, all right, fine, but I need Holbein to go. So once again, and then if you bring up 
Can we yep. go back to our just our Catherine or our Anna Cleves? Oh, yeah. This, this, now I must there, say there's just Anna Cleves. There's, there's this is just Anne, and I think that this is critical for us to see what an exceptional portrait this is. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely filled with detail. Anne is composed. She gives us a great deal of information, which of course is what a full face portrait would do. And this is what Henry's looking for. But mm. if you do, Max, scroll down to the portrait with her sister. Yes, this is the one I was going to go to. Yes. Here. here, this is part of the kind of historical, you know, blip that could have happened. It would have been more expedient for the court at Durin in Cleves to supply Henry with a portrait by their local painter. Mm -hmm. and that would have been you know, much faster than getting Holbein on a boat and then yep. back over. Quickly, just send something. The local painter, the kind of primary painter in this region was Lucas Cronach the Elder, who of course is very well known from his association with Martin Luther, with the reform. And so again, all roads would lead to something like this. But if we look at the portrait of Lucas Cronach, of, of, of Sybil of Cleves, who is the elder sister of Anne, and what that portrait might have looked like had Lucas supplied it, Henry would not have known what to do with this. Yeah. Henry, it's so cartoonish and so flattened and so caricatured almost that Henry, who is used to seeing his own portrait, his own portrait, you know, with Anne, with Jane Seymour, the portrait of Christina of Denmark and all the French brides, had he received this instead, I think he probably would have said, keep looking. You know, it's really interesting. You know, it's, um, it's not putting Henry VIII in the greatest light that he's being very instrumental in the way he's going about choosing brides for dynastic and yeah. political and strategic reasons. But on top of it, you've got oh, to be sexist about their looks. You know, oh, it's... Yeah. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is still a quintessential part of this, is that women have to conform to the kind of prescriptions of beauty that are you know, circulating across Europe at this point. And everyone is signed up fully to those sorts of things. So yeah. I'm not surprised at all that this happens. But what you can see here is that, you know, Holbein, who is later in the 17th century accused of flattering Anne, uh -huh. yeah, because, you know, if you've got this exceptional portrait and Henry says, fine, yes, it's not like there was singing and dancing, I will say like there was for the Christina portrait, but he says, sure, that's fine. Holbein has clearly lavished attention on all of the ornament. He has kind of focused on the kind of symmetry of her face. There are beautiful kind of elements that soften what mm -hmm. may be a kind of, actually a, a sort of middle range of, of female beauty at this point. Yeah, what's interesting, it makes you wonder, who is, who is Holbein working for? You know, is it, you know, is, you know is, it, is, it, is it that he wants to create a piece of beauty in this picture, regardless of who the subject was? Yeah. Is he working for Hans Holbein? I mean, is he working for Henry to say, I'm going to give you the most accurate picture I can so you can make a good choice, sir? Or is he doing it for Anne of Cleves for her own? I mean, it's, just, it's a really interesting, I tend yeah. to think it might be he wants to make a piece of beauty. As, well, in some ways, he wants to make a piece of beauty, but he is, let's not forget that he is a German and has a great deal of sympathy with, you know, okay. form ideas. That's and a much so, less uh, aesthetic reason, even. Yeah, yeah. It may be a more politically motivated choice. And one of the things that you can see is that he very unusually chooses a full front view of Anne. Now, this is not common. Normally, the, the kind of favored view at this point is a three quarters view. And you can see even with the image of, of yeah, Sybil yeah. there yeah. on the left, that that's the more typical way of com composing a portrait. But in doing this, Holbein has de-emphasized what is a very large, bulbous nose. There are other representations of Anne of Cleves that show that she has a, a rather un- 
splattering with nodes. Mm -hmm. And Holbein has softened that by, by showing it to us frontally rather than in three quarters, which would have had, you know, I think a more unsightly look about it. Mm -hmm. He also was able to kind of compose her, her upper body so that the, the, the kind of slim waist is emphasized, that her hands are foregrounded, they are, you know, kind of light, they are bejeweled. And I think that there's something that is very specifically chosen and deliberate about this representation because it is so novel. Yeah. And, and the age at this, what, what would be her age at this, at the painting? I must say that she is 23 going on 24 at oh. this point. Now, you're right, you're right. Everything about that is going to be an issue for Henry because when he finally does receive uh, Anne when she arrives in Calais, you know, he says, go ahead, let's make this happen. So she arrives and they meet, I like that, they meet um, in, on the English shore and we find that, you know, ultimately, ultimately, he says, I like her not so well as she was spoken of. He doesn't blame Holbein for deceiving him. Mm -hmm. He says, I like her not so well as she was spoken of. So it's not a question of Holbein falsifying or even exaggerating, but I think the exaggerations come with the diplomats who had reported that she was so much more beautiful than Jane Seymour, for example. That's really interesting about, you know, what is a painting supposed to be um, representative of reality anyway at the time? This is a major art history question. We don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but, you know, we, we representational art uh, yeah. as a concept in and of itself, you know, you can see the po portrait of Henry, as you mentioned, as an icon. Yeah. It's not really supposed to be representational exactly. Um, and so Henry's listening to the words of these people and they're painting more of a picture in his head than the painting is pictured. Yeah, as long as she was fine, that's all that mattered. But he also, when she arrived, he said, ooh, she is, you know, a full-figured woman. And he, of course, is used to kind of teenagers. He's used to very young women. And he, in fact, starts questioning whether or not she ever had had relations with a man, in fact, she had been engaged to, you know, one of a member of the Lorraine family when she was much younger. But this becomes a kind of impediment to Henry. He says, I can't love her. I can't consummate that marriage. That's clearly someone who has been with other men and I am not able to consummate this marriage. So he prevaricates, he tries to get out of it saying, yeah, I like her not. I like her not so well as she was spoken of and tries actually to get out of this, but there's just no way of dealing with the, the mess that that would have created. So he, in fact, goes ahead and marries her. But it's easier to divorce once you've established that. Well, the beauty part about it is that he doesn't even divorce her. And that's one of the kind of, you know, parts of my title that I wanted yeah. to unpick is that Anne isn't even actually divorced. She is kind of, set aside. It's not even an actual annulment. It just almost never happened. And, and yet, he, was there a ceremony and a they were contract, etc., what we expect from a marriage? They were at the Palace of Placentia in Greenwich. They are kind of fully legally married, but because he cannot consummate the marriage, it almost doesn't exist for him. So there is a kind of annulment, and Anne becomes a kind of sister to the king. That's her new role, is she doesn't go back to Cleves. She stays in England. And yeah. if you show that very yeah. last slide. I'm going to, I'm gonna just show this, uh, that, which slide are we, which slide are we want to, I was gonna show the, uh, some of the legacy uh, that she left. Show, show Richmond Palace. First. Yeah, let's look at that, okay. Because I think this is a pretty good annulment uh, I got it. consolation. Uh, yeah. This one here, this is, again, a major Tudor palace, which was built in the early 16th century by Henry VII. And this is where Anne lives out much of the next, you know, few years. 
she, of course, um, becomes then one of the most powerful women and wealthiest women in England. She is, uh, she has precedence over everybody except the king and his children and future wives, but she lives in luxury at Richmond Palace, which is, as you see, just down uh, stream on the Thames. Yeah, and so I wanted to also point out, we're coming close to having to wrap up, but I want to say she did leave a legacy. for She was queen for yeah. about six months. Six, I mean. months. six months, and there are at least two major commissions that um, are devoted and dedicated to her and her name. The Chapel Royal at St. James's Palace in London was completed and needing a ceiling, and the compartmentalized ceiling that you can see there in 1539 and 40 is decorated with all of the heraldic signifiers of the union between England, Henry VIII's England, and the whole land holdings of Cleves. Yeah, so Ulick and Baird and Mark and Cleve all come together and her family's you know, ducal um, heraldic motifs are all in individual compartments up there on the ceiling, which you can go and see today. Um, yeah. not that so just a little but blip, but that's worthy yeah. of worthy so, of knowing. Yeah. And the other thing is that uh, Sir Thomas Eliot, who is one of the kind of you know, leading humanists at the English court, dedicates his beautifully rendered little treatise, The Defense of Good Women, to Queen Anne, to uh -huh. Anne Cleese. After she case, was, after she was- In this little tiny window, of January to July, 1540, he dedicates this. Oh, so he wrote it when she was reigning, if you will. Exactly, exactly. So, so, as it was printed, as it was printed in 1540, he dedicates it to Anne of Cleves. So again, these are parts of a legacy that we don't always remember that, you know, number one, she was a survivor. She lived for 10 years after mm. Henry. So in some ways it should be divorced, beheaded, survived yeah divorced sorry divorced, divorced. Beheaded, died survived as she even outlives Catherine Parr who is the final of the wives the last of the wives and she dies in the reign of Mary Tudor or she, she is at she is present at the coronation of Mary Bloody Mary uh, in 1553 she attends with Princess Elizabeth so she is embedded in the English court and has actually found a way of remaining somewhat independent, which is unusual for women at this point. Women tend to be discouraged from remaining unmarried. And yet she had enough of a position and an enough apparently will to say, I'm gonna just stay in England and kind of reap the benefits of this. So I have a question about, um, the, the marriage was arranged because of you know, dynastic strategic reasons. Does that all fall apart with her annulment or, uh, you know, what is yes. Henry yes. so almost politically disastrous? Almost That's immediately, almost immediately, Catherine Howard, who is part of the Catholic faction at court, is dangled in front of Henry. And of course, you know, she is the next in the sequence of wives, even before the, the marriage with um, Anne and Henry is dissolved. Catherine Howard is already on the scene. Yeah, so yeah. here's the Catholic faction moving back in. So whatever moves there were toward the reform movement yeah. out the window, and that poor Duke of Cleves loses Gelders to the uh, emperor because he doesn't have the backing of the English king anymore. Just so it, it could have been Cleves instead of Prussia. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's, all, it's all different. And of course, the biggest victim is, is Thomas Cromwell, who, is beheaded very much, you know, as a result of the failure of this marriage, the kind of fiasco. Of and also not being very well liked by the Catholic faction. The Catholic faction really worked hard to, to yeah. kind of put him in a bad light. It's really interesting when you say that, and I just says a general historical sense, what you've just illustrated for us is something I tell all my students about history is that, you know, we like to think of dividing lines as nice and neat. And we think of Henry VIII starting the Church of England, but just the notion that Catherine Howard, like this is a liminal space where people are figuring out loyalty and orthodoxy and all of that. So yeah, it, this is very fluid and Henry kind of, you know, pushes back against Cromwell at this point and the circulation of the Great Bible is kind of yeah. restricted. So 
this is definitely not set at this point. So now, yes, I, you're right. I have I have read the first two of the Wolf the Wolf Hall and was it Bring Up the Bodies the second yeah, yeah. Um, and I have not read the 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 latest one I assume that the latest Mantell novel will be getting into a lot of this all of this all of this have you read it already no it's seven hundred and fifty pages yeah you got time for that <laughs> yeah not 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 at this point actually so anyway. So let's get to a couple questions, if we could. Um, I have, I have. Um, this is a, a kind of question um, that I didn't expect. Uh, is there an Anne of Cleves cake? I heard about it in a documentary. My goodness! If there is, please let me know. I have, I have not heard of that. I love that idea. Yeah, I, I, I assume it would be. Um, I'm trying to imagine how we could. Uh, it would look better than it would taste. No. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, that's not being fair to Anne of Cleves. Um, I also, uh, interestingly enough, um, we have, uh, and I do want to welcome any other questions that we have, but I just am curious what you think about, a, is there a lesson in Anne of Cleves? I know that's a tough thing for all of us to have some sort of moral lesson. I don't want to put you on the spot with that, but what is it that we learn from Anne of Cleves? In some ways, I, I think that we we learn that as you've already said that the situation for women is fraught even through the 16th century when you think that the renaissance is bringing individual kind of you know power to every one of the elite classes you know i think in some ways it's it's a a, a useful reminder that women were very much kind of tokens or commodities that get married into important families for the men to transact larger business. And I think that, you know, the idea that Anne is able then to remain independent, whereas Christina of Denmark, for example, after, you know, saying no to Henry, yeah. she is, again, she doesn't get to marry the man that she actually prefers. She marries into the Lorraine family and has a pretty, you know, difficult existence during the wars of religion. And, sure. you know, uh, all Getting right things, into Marcus Bull's area here. All of the things that Marcus was talking about last week, I think are very much um, something that Christina did not have the opportunity to say what she wanted to have happen. And I think that Anne's ability to kind of rein back the, the sort of move to just place her somewhere else and remain in England was unusual. Now, it's not all kind of fun after, Henry, Henry actually brought her in, he would come and visit her, he would tell her every time he was gonna remarry. During the reign of Edward VI, she did not have um, as much um, freedom of movement. She actually got moved out of Richmond into a smaller palace. And then by the time she's in Mary's reign, she really wants to go home but her correspondence had been restricted. And so yeah. she was not able to actually communicate fully with her brother that she was done and wanted to go home. Which brings us to a great question. Uh, Susan Boncori asked, uh, are there writing writings by Anne, journals, letters, et cetera? You mentioned to us that she wrote in German. So I'm gonna add something to that. Did she ever learn English? And are there any writings and correspondence that we have? It seems like she must have written in English to some extent while she was there. She, she certainly, corresponded with the stepchildren. She did correspond with, you know, Elizabeth and with, with Edward. She bought Edward a, a hat. We, we know a lot about English history because of the letters and papers and kind of um, inventories and records of payments. So as much as anything, we don't have the kinds of journals that you would hope that Elizabeth has later. But I think largely because she agreed in the annulment that she would not correspond with her brother. And so that kind of larger uh, global um, correspondence does not exist. Wow, it's what a remarkable. We're, we're going to yeah. just ignore the wedding, but we're still going to control you after the fact. Yeah, right? oh, of, course, of course, of course. So uh, <laughs> our good friend, former Adams fellow, Alyosha Barranco Lopez, uh, and we've addressed this somewhat. I don't know if uh, maybe Alyosha came on a little bit later, but did Dan ever marry again? Or do we know any more details of her life after she was not queen? Are there any stories of things besides going to the coronation that could give us some glimpse into what her life might have been like? We know that she had kind of German um, 
ladies in waiting as well as English ladies in waiting. We know that she, I think she must have remained a virgin because she seems not to have understood how consummation might have taken place. And from that point, you know, after Henry left, she was never really, um, you know, with any men. She, after, after Catherine Howard was executed, she apparently entertained some hope of remarrying Henry, but he wasn't interested. Yeah, so there must be insights into Anne's life that... So she would not have been allowed to remarry or so. I mean, is it... Is Henry, remarry yeah. Henry. Yeah, she so wanted, it's... She wanted to remarry, she was hoping that Henry would ask her to marry him again. Wow. Once he had Catherine Howard out of his system. So I have a wonderful question from Diane Frazier. Are there portraits of her from later years? There's, there's something slightly later that is at St. John's College, Oxford. Now, again, the dating of that is kind of hard to work, but we don't really have subsequent portraits of her. It's a good question to ask. Yeah. Holbein, let's not remember, let's not forget that Holbein actually dies in 1543, unrelated. He does not get blamed. He does not get the chop. He yeah. dies of the plague. And there's oh, lucky no, him. Yeah, lucky him. There's not actually a big trade in portraiture in the last years of even Henry's reign. Henry doesn't really have portraits made at the end of his reign. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, sub whole line. So there yeah. probably wasn't as much opportunity for that to have more portraits made. And she might have been fairly sequestered. Um, and not really have opportunities to have portraits made. But then again, so much is lost. We don't yeah. necessarily know. It makes us sad as historians. I imagine, especially historians who like to work with things and artifacts that you can look at, of right? Course, so. Of course, of course. Well. Well, uh, Tanya, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. This has been, I just want a little, a little uh, inside scoop for all of our participants, all of us who have joined us uh, through the General Alumni Association that uh, I was just thinking about this biography project and I ran into Tanya in the store and said, would you be interested in such a thing? And the next thing you know, we got it running. So thank you for your vote of enthusiasm and for an incredibly interesting discussion about Anne of Cleves and, and about art history. Um, I do want to mention one other thing that um, Barbara Teisinger has given us in the chat, a link to the uh, Anne of Cleves cake if oh you would like goodness. to. So as I mentioned, it's a beautiful cake and a wonderfully interesting cake, Yay. as we have learned. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank uh, all of you for joining us today. I want to thank our sponsors, the Cotton Merca Group at Morgan Stanley. have always been wonderful helping us, especially with our K-12 programs. Uh, Carolina Meadows, a retirement community, um, has helped us with our adventures and ideas, and we do hope to be doing live programs again at some point. Yes. And of course, our partner in this project, our dear friends, the General Alumni Association, especially Catherine Nichols, who has been so uh, instrumental in helping us publicize all of this online stuff we're doing. Dr. Tatiana String, thank you so much. And thank uh, Anne of Cleves for having been born and allowing us to have a wonderful, and Hans Holbein, and anytime. all of those people. Because what would we do as historians without them, right? Anytime, anytime. Okay, thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Have a wonderful and safe week. Bye, everybody. Bye.